This is your man, Roy Davis Jr., and you're listening to the House Culture Podcast. House Culture. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode in this fourth season of the House Culture Podcast with me, Matt Rouse, your ever-present host and managing editor at House Culture. As always, a huge thank you for letting us into your eardrums for the next hour or so. There are lots of distractions out there, so it's much appreciated that you have chosen to tune into this podcast today. Now, we've seen a big surge of new listeners and followers in recent months. So if it is your first time here, I'm happy to welcome you to House Culture. We are a collective of house music fans who have come together through their mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. The main room for our party is over on Instagram at HouseCultureNet, so throw open those doors and join us and over 100,000 others on that virtual dance floor. Even if you aren't new to this place, please make sure you get yourself familiar with our back catalogue of episodes. There are so many to choose from. Even if you don't recognise the name, I guarantee it's an interesting listen, as we're all about delivering those stories and anecdotes that have helped build our scene. You can always choose something from the legends department like Fatboy Slim, Paul Oakenfold or Danny Rampling. The behind the scenes section such as Pikes Hotel creative director Dawn Hindle, Strictly Rhythm co-founder Gladys Pizarro or Ibiza party people Mike and Claire Manumission or even champions of house music like Youssef, Sophie Lloyd or Purple Disco Machine. We have got all angles covered just for you. Let's get on with this episode shall we? In this one, I chatted to a DJ and producer who hails from the birthplace of house music. That is Chicago, of course. Someone who has not only worked with iconic names from within the scene, but an artist that has created anthems that still resonate today. It's the amazing Roy Davis Jr. In our conversation, you'll hear how his first foray into DJing helped him forge friendships that last to this day. I was messing around with turntables, but it was more like for breakdancers. The break dancers always would come knocking on my door. Can you come out to the alley and play some records? I went through that whole era, and that's when I met Pierre. How he first discovered this new sound called House. House music was starting to trickle in from like cassette tapes of Ron Hardy. I thought it was just wild and crazy because people would go into the music box and they would record. And I was like, oh man, I got to get out there. But at the time, I just couldn't go. So I was in the basement with the 808 and the Juno and start making tracks. And Pierre was just like, man, this stuff is dope, man. You know, we gotta do something with this. How one of his most successful tracks came as a surprise. People are like going crazy on the pirate radio station for your version of uh, Gabriel with the live garage mix. It's like, they're not paying attention to the other mixes. They like this mix. But next thing you know, it was just all these majors was calling for the record. We find out just what it is about this sound that keeps him creatively engaged. House music gives me passion. It gives me community. It gives me the vibe and the touch of love. That's why I create house music. So I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. This is Roy Davis Jr. House Culture. Hi, Roy. Thanks so much for joining us on the House Culture Podcast today. It's a pleasure to have you on board. You've been in and amongst the house music scene since the very beginning, collaborating with legends, working for and setting up influential labels, performing across the world and doing all of this whilst releasing iconic tracks of your own. However, we always like to wind it back at first here on the House Culture Podcast and ask, whereabouts did you grow up? What kind of household was it and how did you first discover music there? Wow. Um, I grew up in Chicago, a place called Chicago Heights, and my family moved around. I was born in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. but my father was a computer-aided draftsman. And before it was computer-aided, it was just a draftsman when, you know, you write so much that your hands swell up. And my dad used to do that like uh, full time, even at home. And and that's what he did away at the office. So um, he always moved a lot, Mm -hmm. you know. So we moved around in different areas of uh, America from Los Angeles, Houston, Tennessee, Chicago. And Chicago ended up becoming like, 
the staple home place for us. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up with both my parents. My mom, she was a a nurse's aide. And uh, my dad did what I I told you. But my my mom also was a musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my dad was a side musician where he played saxophone. So people might say, oh, why does Roy put a lot of sax in his tracks? Well, a lot of times I do it to, you know, to to shine on why, how I grew up with my dad, you know, and what his passion was. But he kind of went a different route so he can provide for his family. And uh, my mom, she was like the gospel leader of the church. And she worked with different artists and musicians locally in Chicago, too. And um, as a songwriter and as a choir director and a, as a pianist. Mm-hmm. And um, we were just surrounded by music all the time. And I would go to my grandmother's house a lot. And my uncle, he played keys for Roberta Flack. And his name was uh, Bernard Boykins. And he was uh, a heavy influence. And uh, to be honest, actually, (laughs) my mom's whole entire side was a heavy influence because I had percussionists over there. And then I had uh, keyboard players over there. And everything was about music at my grandmother's house. <laughs> so back in the day, we can go in the backyard with neighbors and play percussions out loud and there, nobody cared. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just like a tribal type of thing, I would think, you know, that was happening at that time in the 70s growing up that you could be free and make a lot of noise. Yeah. No one <laughs> no one cared. <laughs> and like today, if I pulled that out today, I think all the police would knock at my door today. <laughs> but uh, but everybody used to get together, the uncles, and and play percussions in the back. And at that time, I really wasn't um, tinkering around with like music, like like a pro. Yeah, I would just you know beat the drums with everybody. And and then one day, my grandfather he bought me a guitar, so I started playing around with the guitar. Mm-hmm. And actually, when he gave me that guitar, it kind of leads back to the song when you asked me uh, what was one of the first electronic songs I bought. Mm-hmm. And I used to practice playing, playing it uh, with the song called Numbers by Kraftwerk. Yeah. So it was a very weird song to play with a guitar. Yeah. But that was the first <laughs> thing I was playing, messing around with at that time. And uh, But I was always surrounded by music. The, the whole family was just musically inclined. I wouldn't say I was like any kind of child genius or nothing like that. I was just a person who was inspired, Mm. you know? Yeah, and to to, to be able to live amongst that and absorb it all, like you say, you don't necessarily need to be a genius, but it's just, if it's there all the time, it's gonna have a massive influence on you. Oh yeah, it most definitely did, Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I I didn't think that it would be like a career though. That was the thing. I, I uh, going going past the younger years and going into high school, mm-hmm. I just always played football and basketball and ran track. So I always thought that was going to be my ticket. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's going to be my ticket. You know, then I realized, okay, I'm short. <laughs> but I didn't realize that until, you know, I'm starting to get up against these guys, six, seven yeah. and you know, six, eight, you know, taller than me and basketball. But I still stuck with it, and I still played. I played all my high school years. I did uh, real good in, in football, and I, I made it to college in football. And um, track, I broke a lot of records in high school, from the hundred yard dash to the two twenty, and I ran all the fastest relays. That was the thing that I thought that would be my ticket. Yeah. But for some reason, I chose a college that didn't even have a track team. (laughs) (laughs) So I was the fastest guy on the football team, but Mm -hmm. I didn't have an outlet for the track part, Uh, which was really my true talent. Yeah. And and the football part kind of kind of drained on me because I felt like, okay, I'm I had to change positions. I was a running back and a kickoff return. Mm -hmm. I stayed as a kickoff return, but I changed to a wide receiver Mm -hmm. because of my size was small. Yeah. You know, and um, but the guys love love me because I was fast, so they could throw me bombs and all that kind of stuff. But it kind of wore on me and I sat there and I was like, at the same time, I'm still making beats. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of surpassed the whole me growing up with DJ Pierre, Spanky and Future and all of that, I kind of surpassed all of that, but I and jumped right into the college part. Mm. But uh, 
when I was coming up, before that college part, Pierre used to date my sister. No way. He used to throw local parties, which mm-hmm. draw me into uh, DJing. Mm-hmm. So before before that, I was messing around with turntables and playing a little bit. But it was more like for break dancers. Yeah. So like I would, uh, the, I was the only one that had turntables at that time. Mm-hmm. So the break dancers always would come knocking on my door. Can you come <laughs> and play some records? Can you come out to the alley and play some records? I would go and I, w- I would play, you know, Rocket and mm-hmm. and and uh, watch the closing doors and all those break dancing records, looking for the perfect beat and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, so I went through that whole era. You know, and then. Um, I had moved to a place called University Park, and that's when I met Pierre. And every day I would walk past his house, I just hear all this music going on. Like, I was like, what is going on over there? You know, and and at that time he was spinning probably Italian disco. Mm -hmm. um, I had a little small Italian disco collection, but didn't have much. So he kind of like showed me a lot and showed me actually how to do more DJ tricks. Yeah. I would stay at his house for like two hours a day. I would go after school and after I would finish practice and just practice DJing. You know, and then obviously you were playing, you know, for the break dancers and things like that. Was the ambition then to like I've got to get into a club? I you know, I need no, to No, it just there. wasn't there. It was more of a street thing. Yeah. It was more like you it's like guys would go in the house, grab their cardboards bring them out to the alley and people would break dance, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you just, you, you supply the music and everybody be up rocking and breaking, mm-hmm. you know, it was, a, it was a, it, you know, it was Chicago, but it wasn't New York, but we were imitating what we saw. I would think that was going on in New York at that time yeah. when it came to the break dance part, mm-hmm. you know, but then Chicago started to develop its own, its own character, you know, with, with the whole form of house music. Yeah, but but we went from Italian disco into house music. Mm-hmm. That's how house music came about. Yeah, it was like we all start playing Italian disco, and then um, all of these clubs was popping up that I was too young to go to. I was probably about fifteen mm-hmm. or sixteen, and Pierre and Spanky would go to the music box that Ron Hardy used to do, mm-hmm. and they would be like, "Oh man, it was so cool! You w- man, we wish you could go, man. You need to sneak out the house and go." But my dad wasn't playing that kind of stuff, so he was <laughs> like, "You ain't you ain't going nowhere. Anywhere after nine o'clock, you in a bed, you know." So so that wasn't happening for me. Yeah, you know, came to the Ron Hardy parties until later. Mm. So what was that? So so obviously you were hearing about these things, and you were like messing around with decks, and you were hanging around with with an older crowd that were able to get into those things, you know, what, what, tell us about that first time you did actually make your way into, into a club and heard this music that you've been playing. Um, well, actually the music was always being played in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It was coming around house music was starting to trickle in from like cassette tapes of Ron Hardy, uh, Frankie Knuckles, um, stuff like that was always creeping in because my boys were trying to tell me what it's like. And, and, you know, it was always trinkling in Mm -hmm. while we were uh, DJing. And the next thing you know, I was getting inspired by all of those tapes, which had like the original Time Marches On on there, Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of early Jamie Principal. Mm -hmm. All of that kind of stuff was popping up on there. And I think a few tracks from Jesse Saunders was on there. And... um, I thought it was just wild and crazy because guys used to go in there and they would take these micro cassette tapes. You remember those? Yeah. The little, small, you might not, you might be too young. No, you know? the dictaphone it was, things. It was, it was these little small micro uh, cassettes uh-huh. and people would go into the music box and they would record without people knowing. So you come back with all these raw tracks mm-hmm. and I was like, oh man, I, man, I got to get out there. But at the time I just couldn't go. So um, I was in the basement with the 808 and the Juno mm-hmm. and started making tracks. And Pierre was just like, man, this stuff is dope, man. We, you know, we got to do something with this. And then one day I came up with a bass line mm-hmm. and I started writing lyrics. And this is when I first started writing lyrics. Mm-hmm. And it was called 20 Below. 
Yeah. Uh, it was on this record label. It actually ended up coming out later mm -hmm. um, on uh, Jack Tracks Records, yeah. which it came out under Pierre's name. But we all went in the studio and recorded it. And I had a guy singing. His name was Jr. And uh, he was known for singing Fantasy Girl yeah. for the Fantasy Girl. Mm -hmm. And I was still young. And I didn't know anything about the business. And and really, my friends didn't either. Pierre and all of them didn't know anything either. Everybody would just make records. And then, you know, they didn't know about royalties publishing or anything. Mm -hmm. They would just do it. So we were hired to go into the studio. I'm about, mm, about 16. And I went into the studio, the studio called Star Tracks. Mm -hmm. And I started recording the song. And we didn't mix the song yet. But we had to come back the next day to mix the song. So we all come back, me, Spanky, her, and all the members of Future, and we come back to mix the song. And the engineer says, hey, uh, your tapes are gone. And we're like, what do you mean? It's like, you have no session because the guy Damon came in and he took the tapes and flew back to England. <laughs> so, so we couldn't mix the songs. Oh. So Damon didn't even know I was even a writer or a producer with the song. Mm -hmm. He just thought, oh, it's all, all under Future or Pierre. Mm -hmm. So um, all of those tapes went back. I never touched it again after that. And then I still kept making music. I never felt like bad about it. Yeah. I never felt strange or anything like that. Cause I was still young. I was still chasing girls and still into my music, uh -huh. you know, and sports, you know, but I, it just, the business side of that just didn't, you know, occur to me, Yeah, you know, so life moved on Yeah, and I just kept producing every day, every day. And Pierre and Spanky was like, man, you keep making these records, man. You, man, you need to do, do something for future, man. You know, so I just gradually just kept making music. And in the, in the meantime, I had another partner named Jay Janelle. Mm -hmm. We had a side group with Sheena Mahone called Yamosha. Yes. Yeah. So that's how you saw like Roy Davis doing like acid stuff. But then yet he had this other group doing vocal stuff. Yeah. Because the vocal stuff was me, Jay and Sheena. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I would spend a lot of hours producing that that group actually and we got signed by marshall jefferson first yeah. and i'm still helping out future at the same time oh, right. so it was like a weird situation because they're two different sounds yeah completely so I'm, I'm in the studio with spanky doing rise from your grave <laughs> and then on another side i'm doing all this love type house music <laughs> you know <laughs> but uh we are unity and stuff like that you know yeah. and uh Next thing I know, Marshall's like, man, you gotta, you gotta pick one, man. You gotta, you gotta settle down, you know, pick something. <laughs> you know, you're doing a lot, doing too much stuff. Mm. But I was, I had so much energy. I, 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 it never phased me. I can run in the studio with like eight, or, eight or nine different people doing different things, mm -hmm. you know, and then come back and from acid music to, to tracks to, to vocals, I just will bounce around, yeah. you know, and. I did that for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And then when I, I to skip over all of that part with the the whole future and then running into Marshall Jefferson. When I met Marshall, Armando Gallup introduced me to Marshall. But Armando Gallup was part of the Chicago Bad Boys. Mm -hmm. And I was a part of Chicago Bad Boys, Terry Hunter, Steve Poindexter, mm -hmm. and a lot of earlier guys, you know. And what we used to do was throw parties. Yeah. After that phase, Amando said, hey, man, your record's just so good, man. You just, let, let me get you in, in here with Marshall. Let Marshall hear all your stuff. Mm -hmm. So I let I gave Marshall a tape. My first <laughs> time seeing Marshall, um, he had a fur coat on. He had a fur hat on. I was like, oh, this dude is like, he's coming in here like a pep. <laughs> you know, and this is a party, actually. Uh -huh. A party that we're throwing. And uh, I wasn't even DJing the biggest parties at that time yet. Yeah, It was me doing my music and uh, still trying to get in a bigger door. Mm -hmm. But uh, Marshall came in, he heard the tape. He called me like 24 hours later after the party. He's like, hey man, uh, I love this stuff. I need you to come down here and I'll be at Universal Studios. Can you come down here? And I was like, uh, I can't, man. My car's broke down right now. He's like, I'll send you a car. So he sends a limo to pick up 
to pick up me and Jay Janelle. Oh, and wow. we both were shocked at that time. We like, we made it. We got Marshall Jackson. He blah, 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 blah. It's time, you know. <laughs> so he picks, he picks us up in the limo. We go to Universal. We stand in front of Universal waiting on, on Marshall to come out. He comes out and he says, man, I got to play this tape again. Mm -hmm. So this was so strange. He had the tape in his hand that we gave him. He said, but I don't have nothing to play it on. He said, stay right here. He runs into this uh, stereo shop, mm -hmm. goes in there, buys a box, a big box. And he comes out and he pops the tape in. He plays it on the street, you know? <laughs> and um, yeah, he plays it on the street for everybody on the street. We all listening. After we get out the limo, we listening to this on the street. We didn't go in the, into the studio yet. Yeah. And he's playing, say, like, listen to this. This is just good. You guys are good. You have a lot of talent. You say, you, you need to focus on this. You know, the future thing is cool, but the future is in songwriting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, so I kind of, you know, pushed, you know, future a little bit to the side for a minute. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I did the whole Marshall Jefferson thing. That was about 1989, 1990. Yeah. And I wrote that out. And then I went to Strictly Rhythm mm -hmm. in between going to college. And um, the rest was history, man. I just yeah. wrote it. I just wrote it, bro. It was, it's it, nobody even, my parents didn't even know what house music was. They just thought I was downstairs making some weird shit. It was like, <laughs> what is this dude doing? Cause everybody in the family played instruments, mm. but house was very minimal at that time. Yeah. We had like 808s, mm -hmm. drum machines running with a 303. And to them at that time, it was kind of weird for them, you know? Yeah. yeah. But as, as, as time went on, and my skills got better. They started hearing more and more things come out and they were just like, okay, this boy's got something going on. <laughs> you know, Marshall Jefferson's showing up at the door, <laughs> you know, Pierre's constantly calling, what's going on? Yeah. You know, yeah. I still want to focus on school at the time because my dad was prepping me mm -hmm. to be a computer aided draftsman. So I went ahead and went to school, like I was trying to tell you before, mm -hmm. played my football, but then Strictly Rhythm kept calling while I was in school. Wow, I mean, and we have spoken to um, Gladys Pizarro on this podcast as well and talked about, you know, have co-founding the label and like the, all of that kind of era and stuff. Yeah, yeah. She was like, the I, when I got there, she wasn't there. Yeah. Not the strictly, she wasn't there, but I still became good friends with her. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, at the time when I came in, Pierre was the head a and &R, and it made me uh, like assistant a &R with him. Mm -hmm. And George uh, Morrell was the vice president, yeah. which he did a and at that time too. Yeah. But um, it was more to it for, I think, my job and Pierre's job at that time when I got there because everything had to be edited. Mm -hmm. Back then it was old school. You didn't have a computer to piece these songs together to make them work. So we would go into the office, say maybe nine to four mm -hmm. or nine to five sometimes and then after that we go into a studio D, D studios or battery and we spend that whole night editing other people's songs to make sure that it comes out on the vinyl right so that was like the first steps i was making yeah and i wouldn't fly to new york at that time mm -hmm. i was taking a train because i was afraid to fly no way still keep in mind i'm still a little young and um I'm like, I'm not flying on no plane, man. I'm like, I would take a train. It would take 24 hours, bro. What? Yeah. Wow. It would take 24 hours. But to me, it was a nice ride. It was smooth, you know. It didn't come down to me actually flying there full time and staying yeah. until um, I got hired fully. And then little Lewis said, hey, I need you in the studio. And Lewis was working in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, okay, what you need? So I need some remixes and some extra keyboard work. So at the time I was a keyboard player, you know, people stuff here and there, you know? So I said, like, okay, cool. He said, but you gotta be here tomorrow. And I was like, I can't get no train and be there tomorrow, <laughs> you know? So uh, he was like, you're gonna have to fly with my brother. He's gonna pick you up at your house. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, okay, I'm not at home right now, but uh, I'll get there, you know. And my school, where I went to school at, 
was Joliet Junior College, and it was probably about an hour away from my house. Mm -hmm. So I I go there. His brother picks me up. Long story short, I get on my first plane ride, and I fly out to New York to meet him and Pierre in the studio. And the first song was Club Lonely. No way. Yeah, so that was the first major remix I've ever had Mm -hmm. was Club Lonely. Amazing. And what like what did you find the 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 difference in vibe between kind of Chicago and New York? You know, obviously you were well you you'd been at the forefront of that, you know, the, the electronic music underground explosion in Chicago. Like how different was the vibe for it in New York? Was it behind, in front, you know, it had its own sound? What was the difference for you? It was a lot different because being in the original place of of uh, house music in Chicago, the sound was more raw mm-hmm. and it was more dirty. You, it was more simple, just a 909 and a Juno or 909 or 808 and um, a 303. It was very simple mm-hmm. back then, mm-hmm. you know? And then to come to New York, it was a little bit more uh, musical, more instruments being involved, coming more from the disco era, I would think. Mm-hmm. We it seemed a little bit more electronic in Chicago than it did in uh, like uh, Strictly because I can remember going going to Strictly and turning in like tracks from like Felix the House Cat or Robert Armani, all these kind of stuff. But they didn't even understand what that music was. They didn't even understand like what wild pitch music was. Mm-hmm. Nobody understood that. But then Junior Vasquez started playing that stuff at the Sound Factory Bar. And it just blew up and ev- everything, all of a sudden they just wanted all these wild pitch tracks out of, and they wanted all of these raw tracks, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was just kind of weird, you know, to jump from one place to another and do different things to try to spark someone's attention. Yeah. But they didn't really know, like, they didn't even understand what that stuff was, to be honest. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand what Wild Pitch was or the Robert Armani tracks and the Ghetto House stuff. They didn't really understand that. They liked more musical stuff at yeah. that time, yeah. more mellow stuff. And it was just different, yeah. you know? So we had to break those doors down to uh, get them to know what Hard House was, mm-hmm. you know? Um, now, all those guys was doing Hard House. <laughs> <It's> yeah. like, <laughs> you know, but uh, at that time, they really didn't even, you know, you know those labels, uh, yeah. early eight ball labels and mm-hmm. and Nervous Records, all mm-hmm. of that stuff was really swingy type, mm-hmm. early, you know, 90s house, yeah. you know, which is cool, you know, but it was different than like a, a, a wild pitch track or a future track, mm-hmm. you know, some of that kind of stuff. But um, I enjoyed all of it. I learned, that's what actually helped my career is that I learned all of the different sounds from from New York and Chicago that merged to make my sound. So what? So what happened next then after Strictly and you know you were blo- you were blowing up. You know you were turning in all these tracks involved with you know seminal seminal music from that early era. You've obviously got your own outlet to be creative um, with the label. Were you traveling to Europe? You know, would you were you behind the decks at that stage? What was going on? I had so much going on. I don't even know how I did it all, man. <laughs> I'm be honest, cause even though I was doing all this, I'm telling you, I still was helping the Chicago bad boys with the Chicago underground label. No way. That, that was going on with Steve Poindexter and Amondo. Mm-hmm. And um, so things was, I was still doing a lot of that stuff too, but it was like wherever they needed me, I would just be present, you know, wherever I can fit in. Sometimes I just took a slot and I'll get in. So I was moving around doing all this stuff. But my first actual show as a DJ happened, uh, I mean, on a major scale, I would say it was the Bismarck Hotel, probably 89 or 90 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Steve Poindexter and and Armando gave me that show. And I think it was me, DJ Rush, Terry Hunter, uh, maybe Gene Hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's one more person, but I can't remember who else played it. Oh, Armando. Mm-hmm. So that was like my first major DJ show that I knew I made it. My yeah. my set sucked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did you feel that it, at the time? Did you think that? Yeah, at the time? yeah. yeah at the time, I felt like it sucked. You know, and I go back in my mind, it still sucked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, 
But um, it's like about being in the right place at the right time mm-hmm. and staying focused on your craft. Yeah. And then I eventually, you know, got better. Mm-hmm. And then uh, next thing I know, in between back to the Strictly and, and, and all of that, mm-hmm. my first offer was to go to Tokyo. No way, Tokyo. Wow. Yeah, so Tokyo came for me before, like, England came. Mm-hmm. But England had came for mostly everybody else in Chicago first. Mm-hmm. But Tokyo came and I ended up playing for this club called Club Gold. Mm-hmm. And it was an eight hour set. It was supposed to be me, Larry LeVan and DJ Pierre. Yeah. But Larry LeVan got sick and he couldn't make it. So we were stuck at a person's house um, a day before the flight because we like to set up before we take off. Mm-hmm. And um, Larry came over and it's like he was feeling you know, not well. And it was my first time meeting him, by the way. Mm-hmm. And the only time I met him. Mm-hmm. And he was supposed to come, but he was feeling sick and he couldn't go. So we said, okay, well, we'll we'll change the flight and we'll go tomorrow. So me and Pierre, we left with the promoter and we flew out there and we played Larry's set too. So I ended up playing an eight hour set. <laughs> So, of, like, hours, how, like how many boxes of records were you flying out there with at that tonight? time i had two boxes of records yeah 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 pierre had about two and a half mm-hmm. yeah so we That's both nice. played for like eight hours back to back and wow. we took turns and this club was a very good club and it, it had a lot of history because a lot of the greats played there from frankie knuckles and all, all of the earlier disco guys from new york I think me and Pierre might have been the only guys from Chicago who ever played it. Mm-hmm. And um, after that club closed down, then they opened another club and they called it Yellow. That became more famous later. Mm-hmm. Later on, but yeah, Tokyo was the first country to hire me. Wow! After that, then I went to England. Uh huh. England, and uh, I just I didn't even play when I went to England for a while. Like we stayed there for about a month. Me and Pierre and Felix the house cat. And we just went around shopping music. We worked with Gorilla Records out there, mm-hmm. all these other labels. And we were just, you know, happy, you know, guys to get our music and sound out because England was so open to the growth of the sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were just out there maneuvering and, and making business moves. Yeah. And and today England still is like the like the the uh connection and the source for for most of us with our sound you know yeah and w- when you were over here during that early era were you you know you're making moves doing business deals whatever were you enjoying the the, the underground house music clubbing scene as were you going to any venues experiencing what was going on yeah but i don't even remember what they na- the names people had all <laughs> these weird spots and people used to sing on the mic all the time and it was just a, a whole different vibe out there mm-hmm. you know it was more raw it was real small um uh, I'm trying to think. It was before Ministry of Sound. Yeah. You know, it was before all of that. Yeah. So it was like everybody had parties in all these little spots and mm-hmm. they, they worked. They all worked, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it was just really exciting. And uh, by the time Ministry came around, that's when we were actually some of the first people hired, actually. Yeah. And I, the first show I did was a future live performance. Back then, I thought I was, uh, what's the guy from The Doors? Oh, Jim Morrison? Yeah, I thought I was Jim Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back then, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if it was too much weed. I don't know. But it, I thought I was Jim Morrison back then, man. Um, I would be on stage, running on and off the stage. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was crazy being in Future because I felt like, okay, we didn't turn Future into a rock group. <laughs> we like... <laughs> So it, we didn't know that people was really so much into acid like that mm-hmm. as a house, not yeah. the drug, you know, but uh, we didn't know that people was into it like that. So I think it was that night. It was Daryl Pandy, uh, Future, and I think Farley Jack Master Funk. Uh-huh. And um, <sighs> I was blown away, man. I was blown away. I think who was running it at that time, a guy named Jim Masters. Mm hmm. Yeah, I can't believe I remember his name. <laughs> yeah, Jim, if you're out there somewhere, man, what's up? But um, yeah, so Jim Masters took care of that whole night at that time. 
Yeah. The rest is just history, man. Yeah. We just I was just young doing a lot of stuff, man. I don't even <laughs> know. Sometimes I get lost in the time periods because I couldn't remember that I was doing all of this at one time. Now I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I think and that's that really kind of leads us on to like what what is kind of going on now, but like harks back to a bit of like, you know, the conversation around labels and outlets and creativity and all of that. You know, you set up underground therapy music, you know, uh, UTM and 2023 is obviously a big year because it's, you know, the, the labels relaunching like properly. You know, you've digitized the entire back catalogue. That's all available and you're re-releasing stuff with with new new uh, remixes and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, in terms of when you were looking back at that, um, everything that came out on that label from that uh, those early days, you know, and, in, and bringing them kind of up to date in terms of like digitally releasing them, you know, was that difficult? Was it good to reminisce, get hold of all of that stuff? You know, what was your input in in that? All of that was difficult. <laughs> I would like to say I uh, I went through so many stages and I'm still going through stages mm. because, see, we missed a whole, uh, a whole little era before I got back to the whole underground therapy thing. Cool. Well, go for it. Go I, for it. I, I went, uh, it's like I left, left the whole Strictly, the nervous thing and went to DJ Duke for power music. Mm -hmm. And I did the whole power music round, like picking up all my friends from Fearless House, Captain Ellie Williams to even Pierre, and just, you know, doing the whole wild pitch, crazy track stuff for a long time, you know? And then I made so much money with that. I didn't even know what to do with myself. <laughs> I, was just, <laughs> I was just like, man, I need to slow down and figure out my life. And yeah. it, it was getting kind of crazy because Back then, you could say, ah, I need to make like 20 grand in a day. And you can actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can actually do it. You know, you can go to sleep, wake up and have a goal and attack it and get it in that day. Wow. That's how crazy it was. Yeah. You can walk out of one one business meeting and close 10,000 and go to another one. And close. It was just so crazy for us. People don't even, they can't even imagine. The kids today, they get no advances. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what it's like, you know? But back then everything was selling, you know, before September 11th and all of that stuff. Yeah, It was just like, vinyl was just crazy. So I, I went from that to um, working with a guy named Frank Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. Frank Rodrigo was responsible for like doing a lot of Jamie Principal earlier stuff. Uh, he had Smash Records and a lot of that famous Steve Hurley remixes. He was the manager for Steve Hurley back in the day. And I was like, I need I need to slow down. I need management. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went to him. He was like the, you know, like the, the main like mob boss of Chicago, I would say something like that. <laughs> but he was like the guy to go to. Yeah. You know, and I went in there and um, me, Pevin, Jay, and Jamie Principal was already there. And there was another friend of mine I grew up with. His name was Marky. Not too many people know Marky, but he made some commercial records that did good, Short Dick Man and all that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. But um, we were all there. And the first song I actually made while I was in that studio, I brought my studio to his building. And the first track I made was Watch Them Come. Mm -hmm. yep. And that was me and Jay Janelle. Mm -hmm. And then I called Pevin on the phone that moment when I had the song. And I was like, dude, I just did this. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> and then I laid, everything was already down, the percussions, the, most of the keys, everything was down. I said, we need another vocalist part on this. I played it over the phone. I said, you think you can feel something? Then he started humming some African chants over it. And he was like, oh, I'll be there in an hour. Awesome. So Pevin rushes there in an hour. He sings the vocals. And to me, I'm thinking in my mind, this is a hit. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So um, I was like, man, we need to add like a Moog or something. So I'm playing around with the Moog. And then Pevin said, oh, no, 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 no. Let me try it. He get on there and he fucking kills the Moog. He fucking just destroys it. You know, and me and Jay, we like, damn, okay. <laughs> you know, so at that time, he was, Pevin for us on that project was a hire for help because we had already established men from the now. That's why we featured Pevin. Yeah. And 
So uh, Men From The Now is actually my group, but I, I would put whoever I want to put in it. Mm-hmm. So I, I featured Pevin for that, and uh, it became a massive record. But when we did it, we took it to Frank, who, who was in the office and uh, running things. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, this is nice. I give you five hundred dollars, <laughs> <laughs> and at that time you got to forget or remember. I mean, I've already worked as strictly. I already know my value. I already know, you know, what how much records you know are worth, yeah. and and I'm like, man, five hundred dollars. I paid probably more than that just to sing on the record, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, so it was um, at that time I knew it wasn't gonna work. I'm yeah. one of those guys that I don't waste time. Yeah. So I packed up my studio. I told Jay, and Jay was upset. He was like, man, what do you mean we're going to leave? I was like, dude, we wasting time. Mm-hmm. This guy's offering us $500, don't want to negotiate. We, we're not going to make no money on this, man. Yeah. It's not going to work, <laughs> you know? And he was like, come on, if we stay, you can possibly, you know, do this and do that. I was like, nah, if we stay here, he's going to rape us, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. so that's where my head was at. So um, I packed up my studio in 24 hours, man. Everything in 24 hours. And back then, I had a little car. I had a little 944 Turbo Porsche. Right. Oh my god. With a ha- with a ha- with a hatchback, <laughs> and I put a 32 track board inside of that Porsche, a set of speakers, and all of my gear. Oh man. I smashed it in and I drove off and never looked back. Uh-huh. And I said, Hey, we got to put this out ourselves. Yeah. I got with my other buddies, Odell Brazel and Jay, and we just started releasing records on underground therapy. Mm-hmm. Left and right, we came out under Earth Boys, then we came out under Men from a Now. And we were just, you know, putting out releases and picking up tracks from different people. Mm-hmm. And that's how underground therapy came about because I just, knew that I wasn't going to see my return on Men From The Now. I just yeah. knew I was yeah. you know. Talking about Watch Them Come, you know, specifically, that's the first single, like, on the relaunch of the label and, you know, looking at it the and listening to the remixes that are involved, you know, you've got, like, Green Velvet, Derek Carter, Soul Clap, um, and DJ Pierre's turned in one as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an absolutely incredible array of talent i mean you must have been were you know when you were sorting those out were they happy that they were working on such something that had such a status yeah when all of those guys got the the parts of that to remix those they were all excited mm-hmm. cashmere known as green velvet he was just like just send me the parts let's roll you know as soon as i reached out to him and um so i sent it to him got it done pierre he was real fast. Everybody was they they love the fact of touching the classic and getting it done. Mm-hmm. You know, so we had, we had a deeper collection of it because see, oh, I didn't tell you that the record when we originally put it out, it got picked up by Jive. Mm-hmm. Nobody really knows that, but that's how we end up with the the uh, Jazz Nova remix. Ah, uh, no way. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At that time, I didn't know Jazz Nova. Mm-hmm. So when they picked it up on 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 uh, Jive, we me and Jay did a publishing deal with Samba, and um, they took the the record and they sat on it. <laughs> yeah. So so once they sat on it, I had to go back with lawyers and get the record back, mm-hmm. and then that's how I got the rights to end up doing the Jazz Nova. And having them do the remix, you know, because they had already did it because it was going to come out yeah. on Jive Records. But they said on the record after they picked it up and um, the rest was history. We just made it happen and pieced everything together. And here I am today, mm-hmm. you know, with a classic record label, even got releases from Paul Johnson when we started and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keeping it going. And I never really set out to make like hit records or nothing like that when it comes to underground therapy that's why it's underground therapy Mm -hmm. just to be raw like if you got something that sounds good let's go with it let's Mm -hmm. don't you know a lot of people are real real super picky about certain things if i like it i go with it yeah 
I'm not going to sit there and say, will this work? Will this not work? Nobody knows what's going to work. Nobody thought Gabriel was going to work at work. Nobody really thought certain records Rock Shock wasn't going to work. That ended up getting licensed to Daft Punk. So you just don't mm -hmm. really know what's going to be what. Yeah. So it's best to go with your gut when it comes to feeling of, of, of sound, you yeah. know, and put it out. I try to do what everybody else is doing, but just create. That's yeah. what it's. It, that's what my label's about. Just being, uh, you know, a painter. Just create. Your painting's gonna be different every time. Mm -hmm. You know, don't be a copy machine. Yeah. You know, that's why I try my best. I try my best not to have the, the same records all the time. But you know, people still say, "Oh, that's a Roy Davis Jr. sound." But you know, but I, you know, I do try, but. It's hard sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there is a bit, like you say, like, you know, as long as that sound has, you know, evolved and developed over time, I think there's definitely something in that. I mean, you mentioned Gabriel. That tune, you know, obviously it's been, it was hu huge in the UK, especially like part of the UK garage scene. It almost like created a its own scene of, of in of itself. And, you know, that the, the version obviously is a live garage uh, mix that was the one that yeah. blew up over here yeah. which isn't even the original um you know like you say do, you didn't even you, you don't know what's going to hit and what's going to land i mean di did you realize at the time that this one track of yours in particular was influencing like an entire sound over here um not until the phone started blowing up and faxes at that time you have fax machines uh -huh. But all of a sudden, large records was like, hey, man, we got something going on over here. People are like going crazy on the pirate radio station for for your your version of uh, Gabriel with the live garage mix. Mm -hmm. It's like they're not paying attention to the other mixes. They like this mix. And I was like, OK, he's like, well, what should I do? He's asking me what should I do. And I'm like, um, hey, just, you know, keep getting it out to people and so let's just support the record, you know? But next thing you know, it was just all these majors was calling for the record. Mm -hmm. So that's when me and Jeff sat down and, and we decided that out of all of the choices we had at that time um, to go with XL recording, but we wanted to turn it into an album deal. So they gave me and Pevin like a single deal to do singles, mm -hmm. but all of the singles kept getting rejected. So when they got rejected, it kind of, separated what me and Pevin was setting out to do and we just both went our own separate ways as time went mm -hmm. you know we still was doing live shows with stuff but it kind of tore apart the vision right as far as okay we'll be a group and we'll make this happen you know and then we had me and now that was happening on this side so it was so many different things happening it was hard to focus on what what was really needed i think for all of us at the time Mm -hmm. I think everybody was just, you know, too busy, too young to understand. And we honestly didn't even have management, <laughs> you know? So, you know, sometimes you need management mm -hmm. just to make sure that you stay focused on what's actually happening yeah. in your career, you know? And um, we didn't understand. So, you know, things kind of got lost in the mist. Yeah. But, you know, we made a classic together and God bless us with that. Mm -hmm. and um man he's doing great you know I, i'm yeah. doing good and we're just keeping things going everybody's doing their own thing and making yeah. things so what would you say that track in particular what's your kind of relationship with it now obviously we've spoken to loads of djs and artists and producers on this podcast and sometimes they have like one or two tracks where they're like man i've heard that so many times i'm just over it or like it's a or, or i absolutely love it it got to me to where i am today you know it's a part of me or is it just something that's just behind you i i, I respect it and i love the gift that God gave me and Pevin to do a song together. Mm -hmm. And um, I love to play it still, people. And it's actually one of the most requested besides the believers. Mm -hmm. um, I get, so it's like, sometimes people want to beat me up if I don't play it, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, you know, as, as a DJ part of me, I'm not one of those selfish DJ guys that only want to play his own records. Mm -hmm. I like to play other people's records and my records, you know, or unreleased stuff, you know. So sometimes as a DJ, 
it gets hard because people want to see you play your own stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but after 20 something years of playing your own stuff all yeah. the time, it does get boring, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? So you want, you want to, you know, you know, show them I'm doing this too. And I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I like to play this, this younger guy stuff who's making something good. You know, let me show you this, you know, mm -hmm. cause when I grew up, it was about a DJ being a DJ. Yeah. Breaking a record. It didn't have to be your record. Yeah. It would just be a record, mm -hmm. you know? So that's always been my approach on the DJ side. So it's like, I, I'll play Gabriel for people usually somewhere close to the last, you know, song. So they will be happy and, you know, believers in some of my other songs I've made in time. Mm -hmm. But um, when I step into a DJ booth, I try to step in there as though I'm presenting not only my own material. Yeah, the way it should be. You know, you're a, t yeah. you're a taste maker. People trust in your taste and they know what your sound is. You know, their, their expectation is deliver me something that I know I'm going to like based on based on you. Yeah, and, and, and I come from, you know, I, man, I, I come from where it's special if a DJ has something that nobody heard before. But if you're kind of young now and you think that every time you hear a, a song that's familiar, it's like the radio song. It's like, oh, play the radio song, <laughs> you know? And you heard that song 30 million times on the radio. Why am I going to come into the club and play it 30 million more times for you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? So it happens, you know, to all of us who've had, you know, successful records, you know, you 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 still got to satisfy the people who love you mm -hmm. and why they come to see you, you know, but you still got to give, you got to teach them something too. Yeah. You know, you got to teach them where the music come from, first of all, and teach them your taste, that you, why you're here, why you made it to this level, you know? So to me, it's always been about showing new sounds and, and new forms of music and, and my taste, you know, but I don't be so selfish that I'm just going to play all Roy Davis Jr. Records. <laughs> so it's like, no, that's you good. know, but I got friends who do that and yeah. they're happy with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I have nothing against that, but that's not how I look at DJ. Yeah. Yeah. That's just not how I, that's not how I look at it. Yeah. And, and talking about DJing in particular, this year, it's, you know, it's 2023. You're, you know, you're back out there on the road. You've got some big gigs and some big shows that you're performing at now. That must be an exciting feeling, right? To be back out there. Oh, it feels good, man. After all of that whole COVID drama mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, ha having MS and being put in that kind of situation. I didn't want to, you know, risk my life going out there to DJ. I mean, I lost a lot of my friends from Mike Huckabee mm -hmm. to Paul Johnson just because, you know, they had no fear of COVID, mm -hmm. you know, and and I took that very seriously. You know, um, we lost a lot of good people, you know, during that time, you know, so it's like right now I'm, I'm, I'm being very, uh, uh, excited and 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 very um, motivated, mm -hmm. and, and can't wait to get out to every show. But I'm also being wiser, <laughs> you know, watching how many people I'm dealing with when I'm there. You yeah. know, now mm -hmm. I'm not breathing all up in the face. Ah, what's up? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm stepping back a little bit, still mm -hmm. giving it time. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, well, it's just a good. But it's you know. It was a very serious moment for all of us here, you know? Yeah. This year, I'm, I'm planning on doing the underground therapy tour and getting some of my friends who participated mm -hmm. in the label and some who haven't, but make sure that they do Roy Jr. a favor <laughs> and, and, and bring them a record so I can put them on my tour, you know? And, um, you know, and and hit the rest of the world while we, while we still can. That's my main goal with it. And as far as my performing uh, DJing wise, sometimes I might bring a keyboard out, you know, but I rather focus on the DJing part, yeah. you know, and, um, and just try to grasp as many people's attention as possible in what we're doing today. Cause I mean, we got a lot of new, new youth that deserve to be seen. So yeah. I want to try to get those guys out on the tour mm -hmm. and, uh, and get them known. Awesome. It's, it's, yeah, I'm very excited. 2023, you know, I think this is the year where everyone's back out, really, where it's really kind of starting to, to ramp up again. This is the part of the interview, really, where 
let's talk about the uh, the tracks you've chosen for our perfect playlist. So this is um, the House Culture Perfect playlist. It's on Spotify. It's like every single guest on the show so far has submitted five tracks based on different themes. And um, because of that, and we've done so many episodes now that, you know, this this playlist is massive it's nearly like 30 hours long i think it's huge oh wow Um, yeah it's 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 one of those things you just put on shuffle it's like such a good listen because there's so many different kind of things in there um it's all been obviously curated by all of our guests so it's, it's fantastic um let's talk about your choices that you've submitted um all we kind of really need is like you know i'll give you the theme you just tell me why that song like popped into your head a couple you've already kind of mentioned um Mm -hmm. but what you know what what's their meaning to you and your experience with those tracks kind of within your life so you know we always start off with a catalyst a track that first got you opened your ears into electronic music and you've chosen a track you used to play on the guitar. <laughs> yeah, Kraftwerk numbers, man. Oh, it was just so ah uh, that that song was being man, when it came out, it just was like electricity to the to our boxes back then. Cause we had the little boxes with the two speakers we play in the street. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's before some of y'all time, you know, y'all know. <laughs> and all this other stuff but we used to play our music in the streets mm-hmm. <laughs> you know so um that that song connected to me and pulled me in and so many other songs was was written because of that song actually i think like planet rock and all of that yeah. came from you know it was just one of those songs that just worked for me at that time yeah you know at the electronic twist and and uh it, it was funky and computerized and it was the bomb man it's still a bomb it's still, it's still a, bomb. a bomb yeah i mean you know, you know it's so influential it's so influential all of the early stuff is just nuts all right let's talk about a floor filler if you can um a go-to floor filler for you you've chosen i chose uh the believers who dares to believe in me mm-hmm and the reason 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 why because besides people always ask me to play that song but that song meant a lot to me because I went through a lot at Strictly Rhythm working there at the time. And I made that track. Actually, people don't even know I started when I made it. I made it in uh, one of Jive Studios in London. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to go to a Zuli Records. It wasn't quite as dope as it is now. <laughs> it just had the chords, it had the strings, a beat, you know, and who, who dares to believe in me? I said mm-hmm. that little voice, whatever. But, um, they was like, hey, can you do something else to it? And at that time, I was like kind of stubborn, like, nah. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, it didn't go to Azuli Records. I brought it back home, went to New York, and um, I finished up the record and brought it to Strictly. And uh, Pierre was like, dude, this is a hit, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So um, then we played it for George. Uh, George Morrell and George like this is a hit. Let's just let's just put this out tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it never made it to Azuli mm-hmm. and it ended up on Strictly Rhythm Records. And um, it just it it's one of those songs that when I play it, it reminds me of you know when I wasn't there. And I, and it's like you make it's like people are like oh he's not there, it's not working, blah blah blah. And then all of a sudden you're like who dares to believe in me, man? It's like, I believe in myself. That's why I'm making this track. <laughs> you know, I believe in myself. So that that track has a lot to do with when I play it, the feeling of how I want to, you know, get the floor up and make people feel it's so hype. Mm. And with Steve Graber on the uh, saxophone, which, you know, made another group I had called the Believers, you know, so I had all these groups, man. It, you know, what? why do another question, why do we uh, have all these group names, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why can they yeah. all be Roy Davis Jr. Mm-hmm. to help everybody figure out <laughs> what I've done, right? Yeah. Uh, contract purposes. <laughs> so if something gets signed, then they can sign the name, but not your name. Mm-hmm. They will sign the group name. Yeah. So I didn't have to worry about Roy Davis Jr.'s name being tied up. So that's why I have all these different group names if anybody ever wants to know no way that's, <laughs> yeah know? it's very savvy it's very savvy um yeah. cool all right next next uh, category is the um the sunsetter 
um, a track to uh, soundtrack a sunset. What have you chosen? I think it was uh, Summer in Paris, right? My DJ Cam. Yeah. That's what I chose, I think. Mm-hmm. And I chose that because it's just a beautiful record. <laughs> it's just a beautiful record. And, and you can just play that in the beers. And you can play that, you know, sun come up, bam, sun go down. You can play it. It's just a beautiful song. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people forget about it, yeah. you know? So that's what made me bring that up because it was just a song I think people probably forgot about. Cool. Uh, it's just got a deserving place on the playlist now. That's good. Um, okay, so a tearjerker. Oh, uh, Terry Callier. Yeah. Just in peace. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Working with Terry Callier on that song, actually, with Love Theme was part of because uh, I named that because uh, it was a very spiritual moment for me in, in time. Mm. I had a dream about Terry Callier before meeting him a night before I had a call from Talking Records and it was an old man sitting by a tree and he was holding the Bible and he was holding the Quran. So then I phone rings. I won't go into how deep the dream was, but yeah. he was out, he was outside my window sitting by a tree holding those two books. So I won't go into the dream though. It's too deep for y'all. <laughs> but um, I get the phone call yeah. after the dream. I wake up and it was somebody from Talking Loud. I can't remember who, who owned it at the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was somebody from Talking Loud. And uh, they asked me if I could work with somebody named Terry Callier. And I was like, oh, I never heard of him or whatever. It's like he's a folk singer and he lives in your city. Mm-hmm. And I was like, OK. Um, they say he's an older guy, blah, 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 blah. He worked with Curtis Mayfield. We know you like Curtis Mayfield. He did all of this stuff in the past, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, OK, I'll, I'll meet him. So I meet. This guy, they said, you have to pick him up for the studio session. Mm-hmm. So I make a quick studio session, pick him up like three days later. And it's the actual guy I saw in my dream. No way. And guess what he had in his hands? The Bible and the Quran. What? No way. Yeah. I, I never told the story. I was supposed to save it for my book. Yeah. But it, it's like, so, I, so he's coming to my car with these two books in his hand. And it's an older gentleman like I saw in the dream. And I'm in the shock, like, what is this? What's going on in my life right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, wow. So he gets in the car, and I actually tell him, man. I actually told him about my full dream, which I won't get into, but you mm-hmm. can check that out in my book sometime. You know, but um, he broke that dream down to me, man. And I was just, like, in shock. So we go to the studio, and we do his remake of Love, Thing with Spartacus in one take. Wow. And, and it just brought tears to my eyes, you know. So every time I hear that song, it's a, such a special song. It does something to me. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that is deep. Yeah. And I, and what was so weird about me and him is like I said, okay, this is one one year. I was like, you know what? It's time for me to make another record with Terry Cowley. I reached out. I wasn't hearing anything back. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing you know. I get a message and they say he passed away. So it was just so weird how we were connected, Mm. you know, before we made the record, before we did anything. So whenever I hear that song, it just touches me. Yeah. You know, and I think about him being present and I think about him being gone. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that. yeah, that's a a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's really really touching and deep there's so much you know the universe uh, life just works in weird ways doesn't it sometimes with that connection and that first meeting that you had that's that's incredible and he was and he was a pure gentleman Mm. he was it's like he was a a walking person of wisdom yeah and and that i would never forget i'll never forget he was able to tell me what was going on in my dream. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man, it, you, you have no idea. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just teasing you with, <laughs> with what was said and spoken. But yeah, I, I plan on having that in my book for sure because it, it it's a moment that that has touched me for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, no, I look forward to to getting more more details on that. I mean, that yeah. To, to affect you in such that way um yeah i'll never listen to that track in the same way again now that's incredible um i don't know how to follow that the last tune it's the last tune is the next um the next category you know the crowd are asking for one more 
What are you playing? Yeah, they asked him for one more. When the crowd asked me for one more, it could be anything, really. But yeah. you, this one, it's like, because the one thing when I'm spinning, I never want to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, first they'd be like, oh, we're going to give you two hours. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Next thing you know, you're going three hours. And then you want to go four. It's like, you want to keep playing. Yeah. So, um, my buddy, he made this 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 remake of Let the Music Play. Mm -hmm. It never came out. And I still keep it in my playlist today. It's, it's a version of Shannon's Let the Music Play. Mm -hmm. And it's done by Will Real Soul. Yeah, man. It's one of those one of those tunes that let the music keep playing. Let the music play. Yeah. You know, so that yeah. that's one of my tunes I, I like to to end with if it's not one of those special requested ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and like that in that track, the Shannon Let the Music Play, that remix of it, it is on your Chicago boiler room set. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, this is this is the uh the end of the interview. Um we always but we always have one last question which we always ask, which is um All right. you know, we are um house culture, you are on the house culture podcast right now. And in terms of club culture, the house music community, all of these things of us like all coming together just to dance and listen to beats and have fun and connect, you know, what does the house culture community mean to you when someone says house culture, club culture? What does it mean to you? To me, it means unity and um, it's, it's a freedom mm -hmm. of expression that a lot of other music genres don't get a chance to do nowadays you know they have to lock down into what is popular and i think with, with the house music culture for me it's freedom you can talk about whatever you want you know if you 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 feel happy that day you write about your happiness you feel sad you can write about being sad you want to talk about your your beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, you could do it without somebody saying stop. You know, and as a dancer, you know, I grew up dancing, you know, also don't dance no more. So don't get that wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh I don't dance anymore, but uh only because of the MS. But mm. it it just it, it makes your spirit free, man. And it's it, you just gotta have like passion. And house music gives me passion. It gives me community. It gives me the vibe and a touch of, of love. And you're able to spread love without somebody trying to, you know, put you into a box, you know. And um, that's why I create house music, because of its freedom. And I've done it all. I could do hip hop. I could do R&B, all of that stuff. I work with Babyface and everybody, you know, I've worked with, mm -hmm. you know. And um, house just makes you feel good you know perfect that's a that's an amazing final thought thank you so much for for sitting down with us and taking us through your career it's been wonderful thank you roy thank you thank you and what you not i don't want you guys to never forget that it is a culture of love man it's a culture and don't fuck up our culture man <laughs> you know, let this culture ride out and, and believe in the pioneers who started this music because we had a goal with it, you know. So don't just go out there thinking, oh, I'm just going to make this money off of this music. Yeah. You know, think about the roots. Think about the guys who put the blood, sweat and tears and couldn't do things because they, they set aside their whole life for music, you know, and this particular genre, you know. So don't shit on them. That's all I got to say. No, totally. Because we love it, man. And we love you. Take care, bro. Peace. <laughs> House Culture. Peace indeed. Thanks so much to Roy for that. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to him. And what a message to all of us to remember that we have to nurture and grow this scene. So let's all look after it, as well as our own places within it. I was also really touched that he shared that incredible Terry Callier story. Can't wait to read more about that in his book whenever it might come out. If you're listening in the UK and hoping to catch Roy Davis Jr. before the year is out, he is playing at the Jazz Cafe on the 1st of September, so grab your tickets for that whilst you can. But if you can't make it to that, 
and you still want to hear what that Roy Davis Jr. sound is all about, you can of course listen to his submissions to our House Culture Perfect playlist on Spotify. Just search it up under House Culture Perfect playlist. However, his special Will Real Soul edit is not on Spotify. That's the one of Shannon Let The Music Play, but you can hear that on his Chicago Boiler Room set from 2014. That means there's an extra slot available on his Perfect Playlist submission. So I've gone ahead and done it. I've replaced it with the one and only live garage mix of Gabriel. And whilst you're on Spotify, you can now leave us a comment on this episode in the Q&A section, just under the episode description on your mobile. So it's now even easier to get in touch, no excuses. But if you're not listening on Spotify, you can always leave us a review on Apple or drop a comment on our Insta page over at HouseCultureNet. Your feedback honestly means the world to us. And if you're nice, we'll give you a shout out on a future episode. This time around, I'd like to say hi to Leon Das, who after listening to our chat with Youssef, said that it was a great episode and he really wanted to hear that 500th essential mix that Youssef mentioned was so special. So Leon, I've dropped you a link in the comments on that episode. Make sure you go back there to find it. Thanks again, one and all, for listening. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at HouseCultureNet if you don't already. And also follow the hashtag TrueHouseCulture. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, you can always do that on Instagram at DJ Matt Rouse. Thanks for listening. Rave safe. See you next time. House Culture.